<laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Building Your Artist website with Jen Hernandez. My name is Claire Elam. I am the program director for the Artist Accelerator at the Art Center. Um, I just wanted to welcome you and give a little rundown of the Crowdcast platform before we get started. Um, to your right is the chat button. Um, so you can chat throughout the event, um, kind of ask yourselves questions or share some information. And then if you want to ask Jen or myself a question, to the left of that is an ask a question tab. It looks like we already have one. So um, you can add questions throughout that. And then as Jen, Jen gets to those topics, um, I'll interject and ask those questions. And then at the end, if we haven't reached some of them, um, we'll review those and other people can ask questions. I think that's about it on my end. I will say um, check out Jen's website, inklingsillustrated.com. And then you can check out the Art Center's website and our Facebook for upcoming events, most of them being online. Um, Arts Alive will be happening this year online, so check that out in August. Um, and let's get started. Welcome, Jen. Thank you. I'm really excited to be doing this. This is um, different for me. This is my, gonna be honest here, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. Um, I've had lots of like, Zoom gatherings and workshops um, over the past couple of months, but never just kind of me. So if I'm a little bit nervous. That's definitely what that's about. Um, I have been working on my website and um, professionalizing my artist career for um, really the past couple of years and giving it just, you know, all of the effort and time and attention over the past few weeks. And so I'm excited to share some of the things that I've learned. Um, this is still very much, uh, I'm still very much in a learning stage and I probably always will be. Um, and so as we ask questions and kind of get into a little bit of what I've learned, I'm interested in hearing what you guys have done, questions you might have, um, and advice that you might want to share with the rest of us. So um, I love for these kinds of opportunities to be things where everyone can kind of be part of the conversation. Um, so yeah, that's, um, other than that, I'm an illustrator. I'm here in Corvallis. It's a gorgeous day and we're all in front of our computers. So let's do this together. I am going to share a presentation that I have, I think. Here we go. Let's see how this works. There we go. Thank you, Claire. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then I also have um, some websites in a Chrome tab that I might want to refer to at different parts. And so I might need to switch what I'm sharing. I don't, we'll figure it out when it gets to that point. I think that's possible. Okay. So then can I actually use my screen? Here we go. All right, so building your artist website so that you can connect the world to your art. Um, Claire, as I'm using this presentation, I can't see if there are questions. So just like interrupt me um, in the rudest way possible if you can, if people have questions. Sure thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, so just to start off, as I kind of said before, um, my style when doing these kinds of things is to co-learn together. I'd like to be learning as well. Um, and so as that is, and, and I'm still kind of like in a new stage as, um, with my own professionalization, these are gonna be suggestions based off of what I've learned so far. And they're certainly not rules. And even as just suggestions, they're things that I have kind of done the opposite of anyway in my own work. So um, really what I'd like is for you to kind of hear what I have to share and then kind of take that information and apply it to yourself in a really authentic way. Because it's your website, just like your art, it's a very creative process and it should be really authentic to you. Um, that's what people are gonna connect with when they connect with your art. They're gonna connect with the ideas that you have and the ways that you share your unique perspective. Um, and then of course, as we're gonna do today, um, find inspiration from other artists, You know, look up people, see how they, they do their thing and how you like to go through their websites. That's what I did to sort of build my website experience. Um, we're gonna look at a few different kinds here. So there's lots of opportunity to, to see what fits for you. Okay, so whew, we're all here talking about artist website. Probably isn't necessary to go through the whys, but 
you might want to check in on what are your reasons for hosting an artist website. Um, it's important if you're creating art that you want to connect your art to the world. And so an artist website is for that specifically. There are lots of different options um, depending on who you want to connect with and how you want to make those connections. And so there are things like portfolio sites um, that are just art, you know, like ArtStation, DeviantArt, can also have a little bit of blogging on there as well. There are free sites that you can connect to kind of a wider network that other people are using that are not necessarily for visual arts. You know, maybe there's bloggers and writers and all sorts of things. Um, direct customer connection sites including Patreon, Twitch, where you can really interface with people. And then there are sites that are specifically optimized for selling on them. Um, so I'm kind of curious. I wonder what people are mostly interested in when it comes to an artist website, what you want to do. Does anyone have any of those suggestions? It says unable up. Oh. Can people hear me? <laughs> I can hear you, Jen. I think a couple people are having some technical difficulties. Um, OK, well, I can respond to these folks who are chatting right now. Um, so you, so folks want to sell art. They want to sell online through their own platform. Um, that's what I'm seeing here. I think even the question that's in here is about selling art either through their own website or through Etsy or DeviantArt, leveraging Patreon. Great, OK. Technology is fun. Sell and show. Okay, great. Yeah, so you want an artist website. That's great. You're in the right place. So, yeah, thinking about how that's going to look, then you're going to want to look at artists who sell through their websites, obviously. Do you have a couple of examples from people who are local to our area? Um, that have great shops on their websites that um, we can kind of take a look at and go deeper into. What an artist website is seems obvious. So it's your spot on the internet for people to find what, what it is you do. Um, it's part of an overall strategy for connecting with an audience. So whatever it is you make, um, making sure that you're finding ways for people to find you is really important. And that overall strategy has to include things like in-person, so like fairs and conventions, um, having your actual art, if it's something that's tangible, um, and shops like the Art Center so that people can find it, pick it up, and be intrigued and wanna learn more. Um, social media, things like that. So it's a website isn't gonna be the only way that people are gonna interface with your work. It's gonna be one way. And it's gonna be one way for people to go deeper too into your work. So if they are, um, if you're at a convention or you're at a, a market and people like what you make, but maybe they're not quite ready to buy, um, having like little business cards, obviously with your website on it is a great way to make sure that you can keep that engagement going after everyone's left the fair um, and people can continue to engage with your art. What it isn't is kind of a gray area. Um, I would suggest staying away from making it really personal. Um, there's certainly some, you know, like wiggle room around that, especially if your art is part of an overall brand, you know, lifestyle that you want to sort of put out there. Um, I can imagine people who have a really kind of aesthetically driven environment that they might want to share some of those things with their art. Um, you know, if you're a painter, maybe you don't want to post like about your favorite bread recipe, just, you know, thinking about how to direct it specifically to your art, unless bread makes sense to your painting. <laughs> um, similarly with like uh, sharing ideas about politics or current events might ne not necessarily be something that you want to share on your artist's website, unless that's what your art is about. So in general, whatever is on your artist's website should be directly related to your art, should make it um, some way to engage further with your art, to understand your art, and for people to connect with it more. Um, so if you, you know, are a painter and you paint mostly bread or, you know, things like that, maybe you do want to share a bread recipe. Maybe that's a way to connect with people deeper about the art that you make. Um, but just thinking really clearly, if it's at all confusing or 
you know, if there's ever the possibility that someone might end up on your website and be in a corner of it on a blog or in a newsletter and be like, I'm not entirely sure what this person's about. It's probably not something that you want on a website, especially if you're trying to build connection with customers um, and kind of develop long-term relationships with people who will be following your art for a long time. Okay. So then this is kind of the meat. Um, we're definitely gonna go into some of the logistics as far as getting domain names, choosing what kind of website, what platform you might wanna have your website on, um, you know, Shopify, Wix, Weebly, all those things uh, a little bit later. But I kind of wanna just get out there the things that you really want on an artist website that makes it an artist website and not some other different kind of website. And so there are two main things you definitely want your portfolio and your contact information on your website. And then I think having an about section is really kind of fun. It's a nice way for people to connect with you, but it's not necessary. And then added stuff that you can have on your website uh, would be a shop, newsletter, other social media, things like that. Okay, so going deeper into it, your portfolio. So there's some hard and fast rules about having a portfolio on a website. Um, it should be the very, very first thing people see when they open your website. So let's take a look at, oops. One of these here. Okay, so how do I share a different application? There we go. Okay, so I have lots of different. Oh, Jen. Mm -hmm. oh, there we go. Never mind. It wasn't popping up for us. Going slow. Okay, so I have a lot of different websites up that I was kind of going over. Um, when it comes to having a portfolio on your website, there are some rules here. You want to have that principle of above the fold um, art that people will see immediately and that will they'll know that is yours. So. That above the fold idea, if you're familiar with like laying out newspapers um, or journalism in general, in websites it works the same way. When someone gets a newspaper and they're holding it in their hand, they're gonna notice very first anything that's on the front page of the newspaper above where it's folded. Um, and on a website, what that really means is anywhere that the page lands, that when you open up a website, the very first thing you see is above the fold. Um, I can certainly scroll on my own website here to see more art, but I have here um, all the most important things that are that I want people to see once they get to my website. Um, looking at some other sites here, we have Carrie Tasman, who is a local artist. And when once you get to her website, the very first thing you see is this really gorgeous picture um, of a field. It is very much a Carrie uh, painting. You've got some information about her. So this is how she's laid out her website, um, her very first splash page really to, to show something about her work. Similarly with Jennifer Lomers, whom I adore. Um, who else we got? Ellen Byer, she is also a local artist. If we go to just her website front page, then we should see her most recent project was a Les Mis project um, that she has on here that you can kind of scroll through. So these are also different ways to show your portfolio, show different kinds of work. Here's Alexander Schaefer's. So while there's still stuff that we can scroll down and see, including you know past projects, she has a little watercolor um, self-portrait here. She's got art for sale, and she's even cleverly got a small um, video kind of cut out of a watercolor tutorial. And that's the very, very first thing you see. Um, as you're laying out a website, thinking about having the option to, um, to like buy things immediately once someone gets to your website is really great. So um, Aminda Dollywall is someone that I really like and she has a um, book out called Women World. And right down here at the bottom, the very, very top of her page um, is a, a buying button, purchase button that's always there. 
And I just think that's really clever because no matter what, if I just like accidentally stumble onto a page, I'm gonna be able to see that. Okay. I think it's gonna be kind of clunky to like go back and forth to my presentation, but we'll do it. Um, making sure you keep your artwork fresh um, and update it regularly. Claire, can you see my presentation <laughs> if I'm doing this? Uh, I cannot see the presentation, just the website. Okay, all right. So I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, you can certainly integrate your um, portfolio with an Instagram. I wasn't able to find an example of that among artists. Um, I know of some like lifestyle influencer type folks who have their Instagram just instantly kind of laid out on their website. So as they're posting on Instagram, it goes immediately to their website. That's a great way to kind of shortcut, making sure that your website has the most up-to-date um, freshest stuff that you've made. Um, so just, but also, you know, being conscious that you've got new things going up there all the time is really good. Um, what I like about Ellen's website also is that she's kind of broken it out into different projects. So she's got her portfolio specifically for her Les Mis project. And then she's also got, you know, other stuff that you can kind of see, there's a little, uh, there we go, oops. Um, so if someone's going to your website and they're like, ooh, I really love, let's see, if we go to Carrie's, I really love the way Carrie does, um, you know, her paintings, and I wanna specifically see Carrie paintings, then someone can find them pretty easily um, within a few clicks. Or if I'm actually here to look at Carrie's children's books illustrations, then we can go, to that instead. And, and, you know, it's nice to be able to make it easy for people who are going to your website to look at something specific um, so that they'll find it. So having good organization, um, drop down menus are great, keeping it as simple as possible, especially when, right when you arrive to the very first page is super important. Um, there's also, you know, more stuff down here as well, including like books that she's made, um, different things that, you know, you can integrate or you can interact with as a, as a viewer. And then, so if you wanted to just stop there, if as an artist, you just want to have um, an artist like portfolio online, then you can totally do that. Um, this person, Rosha, is a sculptor who uh, works out of LA. And the first thing you get when you go to her website is this sculpture that she's made. And then a long list of shows that she's been in, reviews of her art, um, all sorts of things like that. And that's it, that's her entire website. It's just this one page and it, you know, works fine enough. It's basically just an online CV. Um, she's not trying to necessarily sell through her website. And so for her, this probably works really well to get people engaged enough with her work and to see what she's done otherwise so that you know, they can take that engagement a little bit further. Um, the next super most important thing though, that even she has is a contact page. And so on every single website that we are looking at here, I made sure there is a way to contact the artist. Um, so having your um, art up, super duper important, obviously, because it's an artist website. Having your contact is just as important because if someone's coming to your website, they like what you make, you want them to be able to reach out to you, maybe ask you some questions. You want to create an engagement that um, someone can feel like this is a personal connection, um, especially when it's through art. You know, people want to feel like um, the art is something that they can relate to personally and potentially the artist can be someone that they can relate to personally. Um, even if you're not going to make a whole website, you know, on your own, hosted on your on your own thing, if you want to do like an art station, there is a way to contact people. Lance McCarty is also um, a local artist here in Corvallis and he uses ArtStation. Um, for his, you know, design and his his concept art, and ArtStation conveniently has a way to message people. Um, similarly with Kurt Matson, this is also a way for me to show people um, the artist websites of my friends. Essentially, um, people I admire. Sarah Anderson is um, also a really cool artist. Um, she was in Portland, but I think she is somewhere else now in the world. Um, her about page also doubles as a contact. That's where we're at here. Um, and I think, you know, 
when I'm making my website, when I'm designing it, I like to think, how do I interact with the website? If I'm looking for a way to communicate with someone like Sarah Anderson, if I don't see somewhere up here a contact specifically, I'm going to click the about page, find her about page, and then usually kind of scroll through and see if there a way um, to communicate with her. So thinking about how your visitor to your to your website is going to try to navigate your website, obviously, is, is like a really important way to designing it. Okay. I'm going to close this and go back to my presentation. I don't know if you can hear my cat, but she is going to be meowing at me. Here we go. Okay, so we've gone over profile or portfolio, making sure that it's the very, very first thing. Your first front page is going to be your profile or your portfolio, sorry. Um, should have all of your latest artwork on there. It should be updated um, regularly. Your best stuff, the stuff that you want people to see about your art should be above the fold, meaning it's literally the very first thing they see. Um, I like to make sure that all of the art that's together looks pretty much the same because I like to think that People who are visiting the site want to have confidence that they know what they're looking at, that it's all my work. Um, so just kind of keeping that in mind design wise and what you're choosing to put up on your website. Um, like I said, you can integrate with in Instagram or other social media to kind of update it more regularly. And then separating things into categories like Ellen Byer did so that people can kind of go through and see like, oh, this is her work about Les Mis and this is her children's books. Things like that um, are great to help people navigate your website. And then oh, that last one there is including shows. If you've been in shows around town at the Arts Center, um, you know, showing at different places and reviews that might have been written about your work, those are great to have on your website as well. Of course, um, include them or excerpts of them with links to the original um, sources. That's that's fantastic to do. Just kind of um, it helps, honestly, with your uh, search engine optimization to your website, because the more connections there are to other places on the Internet, then the more likely people are gonna be able to navigate to your site from other places. And then our contact page. Um, so different ways to do that. You can use a contact form that's generated by the platform that you use on my contact page. Um, I use a form that Wix, you know, just kind of allows me to drag and drop and place it in wherever I want it to be. Um, you can have a newsletter as a way for people to interact with you, a messaging app like on ArtStation. The most important thing, of course, is to just be really accurate about people, about how people can um, interact with you, how they can contact you, and then to consistently check that and make sure that you're up to date with you know, things that have come in. Um, yeah. And then the about page um, is totally optional. There are artists' um, websites here that I've been showing that don't have them, and that's totally fine. Um, but I kind of like them to have an about page, maybe with an artist statement, a little bit of information about your life and your work as, as it relates to your art um, so that people who are interested can know a little bit more about your context and where your art might be coming from, what your goals are for people. Um, and you can also include links to your social media as far as like, you know, where your art might be found online as well. And then you can also have lots of other things as well, like blog newsletter. I know Jennifer Lomers um, has been sending out a newsletter. I have a blog, I'm not so great with it. If you're gonna have a blog or a newsletter, it's really nice to be very regular about that. Um, so for me personally, I'm not sure that my blog is really an important element of my uh, website, but I kind of just like it for myself. Um, links to your other online presence. If I go to uh, my website, just to show you what that looks like, I have to navigate again. I think we're getting good at this. Um, I keep all of my other social media constantly like at the footer of my of every page that I have. So if I'm going to my portfolio, 
or to my classes page. It's always down there. It's always in the same place um, for consistency's sake. I'm going to scroll all the way down. Actually, my blog is just going to keep updating stuff, but it's always down there. Um, having a way that people can continue to interact with you is great. So I showed you Lance McCartney earlier. He has his social media up here. Um, I think he was the only other one that I think linked a lot of that stuff. Alexandra has her uh, contact information. I think she has her social media, however, up here. Oh, Instagram right there. So there's lots of ways for people to interact with you as an artist from your website. Okay, back to the presentation. Are there any other questions at this time? Because I've already covered kind of a bit of information. Ooh, there are questions. There are a couple questions about um, using Etsy versus their own site or deviant art. Mm hmm okay. okay. Kind of the pros and cons, I think, is maybe what the question is referring to. Yeah, so we can get into a little bit of logistics here. I'm gonna go back to sharing that presentation. So um, the way that I've linked a shop to my website is that um, kind of like I have an Etsy shop and then I link it to um, my website specifically. Instead of going back and forth like this. Show you from here. So this is my method is I just have my, my Etsy shop um, just always kind of somewhere on a page so that people can click to it um, and, and see my shop. The pro about this is that it's free to have an Etsy shop and then just drop a link on my website. Um, another pro for me is that I do um, printing through print on demand sites. And so I'll create art, uh, illustrations, visual art. I will send those to a printer and then um, that printer integrates with Etsy so that as um, I can hear myself. So that as people are purchasing like a cat mug, um, that printer will just get that order, print the mug, and then send it out to them. I don't actually have to have any inventory at home um, because I have that kind of set up between myself, a printer, and Etsy. Um, Con to that, that it costs a little bit more. Uh, I end up having to pay upfront for every item that is ordered through that print on demand shop. So someone will order a cat mug. Um, I'll see that they've ordered that, and then the print-on-demand shop will see that they've ordered that. Then the print-on-demand will email me and say, like, hey, you got to pay for this before we make it and send it out, and I'll pay for it. And then they'll make it and send it out, and then I'll get paid through Etsy. So that's one, just, just how it works. Um, could be a pro, could be a con. Um, obviously, I think that it's worth it at this point. Um, another con specific to our current in, uh, situation is that my print-on-demand source um, is experiencing a lot of slowdown because of the coronavirus shutdown and all the, the different things that people are doing to keep themselves safe and healthy. So there is a long time between someone making an order and someone getting their product from my print on demand shop. Um, it's just kind of how it is. Um, I also kind of make sure to communicate with the people who have purchased things for me so that they know like, I'm sorry that this is gonna be so late, but these are the, the situation. and. You know, people kind of, I think, appreciate that that uh, communication. So that's what I do. It is free to do this. It's free to have uh, um, an account with a print-on-demand shop. There is a little bit of upfront cost just to make sure the product gets made and sent to the, um, the buyer. Now, to have a shop on your website, so if I were to um, actually just have a page on my site that's like, you can buy stuff here, Let's go back to Carrie, because she has that. I don't actually know how Carrie does her art store. Um, this might be, I'm pretty sure this is Shopify. Yeah, so Carrie has 
her website, her artist's website with pretty much all of her work. This is more of her portfolio website. It's got her illustrations, her paintings, um, you know, a little bit about her, her resume, all, all of these, you know, things about her as an artist. And then she also has her shop, which is a totally different website, which I discovered while I was, um, you know, researching this. Oh, it's a Weebly, um, which you can tell because it has a little W up there. And so in Carrie's print shop, um, you know, you can order things directly. It feels like it's ordering it directly from her, not having to go through Etsy or something like that. Um, the pros on this is that that person has that experience. Your, your buyer has that experience of this is art directly from the artist. Um, you can with through Weebly, um, another, you can do this through Wix. You can also do this through, um, Squarespace, you know, lots of things. I think even possibly WordPress, you can host a, sh a shop on WordPress. Now, um, you can design the interface that the, that the customer has directly. So you can make it all look like your stop, your shop, your, your art is kind of making this instead of having that, you know, standard Etsy shop feel where Etsy's in the corner and it doesn't feel like it's totally mine as an artist. This feels like this is Carrie's shop. Um, the possible con to that is that there is a cost to hosting a shop that people can purchase through on any of those sites on Weebly, Wix, Squarespace, um, any of them. If you're going to be taking e-commerce through the shop. Um, so like if I wanted to purchase something, you know, from her and I'm and this is where I would, let's see, let's just do a little thing here um, where I, I'll have a cart on this shop and I'll enter my you know, credit card information to, for her to take payment information through her website. She does need to pay for um, that level of the application and they all have that option. Um, I know that through Wix, so I had this open on, let's see here going to just kind of look at a different screen. Sorry, Claire. Didn't realize that this would be like so much back and forth. I had all of my Chrome tabs ready. So this is going to show us just the different um, levels of um, like upgrades, the different pro levels for these different sites. So to switch my Wix website from what I have right now is just the pro site, which means that I can have a custom domain. Um, I don't have any ads, things like that. You know, I paid this much. I have that level um, to switch it to an e-commerce. I'd have to select a different uh, account type um, and it would have to be one of these essentially. And so there's added cost essentially is the is the biggest downside. Um, you, you know, I'm not actually sure how, I'm sure that it's possible to have print on demand working with things like Shopify um, and other, other um, online e-commerce sites, but I haven't actually looked into that. Um, so that, that may still be a possibility if you don't want to have like a bunch of stock at your house or a bunch of cards kind of sitting around. Um, you want to just be able to send those out as they get ordered. Um, you can still do that print on demand stuff. Does that answer that question? I want to make sure that that as fully as possible. Jay. Oh, there's more question. Cool. All right. Um, I am using Wix. I really enjoy Wix. I was going to, let's see, I'll just, you're still, no, I'm not sharing anymore. The other question is, are there differences to pay attention to with desktop view and cell view? Oh, yeah. OK, yeah, let's go. Let's go into like what it looks like to work on a Wix site here. Let's see. Am I sharing the right one? Can you see my dashboard? Yes. OK, great. So um, this is Wix. I have used Squarespace as well, uh, making a website for somebody else. I just really like Wix um, because it gives, I think my experience with it has been that I have more control over what it looks like. Um, you know, I can really kind of get detailed in how buttons look and how they interact and all sorts of things like that. 
I haven't found that kind of versatility with Squarespace. Um, and I have used WordPress so far back in the past um, that I don't think anything I could say about it now would be really accurate. Although, you know, way back in the past, it felt a little clunky to me. But um, I would suggest to you to just kind of go through each of them, make a free site. Like obviously don't start paying for a bunch of different um, accounts on all these different platforms. Just try, you know, what does it feel like to customize this? Does it feel like something you can navigate or research well enough to feel confident about? Um, that would be my suggestion as far as figuring out um, what site would work for you. I use Wix. So when I use Wix, um, this is what my Wix looks like. Go up in the back end. So there's my website. And editing is pretty simple for me. Um, as far as mobile and uh, desktop, you definitely want to make sure that it works on both because I don't know about you, I spend a lot of time on the internet. There's almost nothing as frustrating as trying to use a website on my phone that looks fine on the computer, but like is really frustrating, you know, like text is going off to the side or images aren't loading or whatever it is um, to just feel like I, like I just don't want to spend any time at all on that website. Um, so the way to do that with Wix is really simple. There's this little toggle up here that's either desktop mode or mobile mode. And I hope this looks all right. Okay, so this is what the mobile version looks like of my website. Um, what I like about this, we can't really see it on here actually, we do preview. Um, the way the menu works is kind of important to me, making sure that it's possible and visible for people to navigate through my website no matter what. So if you're on my website on a mobile device, you can click those three little lines or tap those three little lines and get to the full menu of of everything basically that's on the website. I don't know if it's gonna go to my about page. I might be testing my the computer's like speed and ability right now with casting and editing a website all at once. So we'll give it a break here. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really great. I think, I think Squarespace can also do that, um, can confirm what you know, the mobile view is. So definitely try things out. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Jen, um, can we talk mm -hmm. a little bit about um, uploading photos and sizes and things like that that you use oh, yeah. or you found are useful? Yes. Um, so I, as an illustrator, um, I just generally use the, the standard 300 pixels per square inch um, whenever I'm doing anything. Let's say here, just go to my website on this tab. Um, so not so much for my sketchbook pages, just because it's not really important for people to get um, a super clear view of those. Um, but whenever I'm uploading something that I really want people to see and, and to see in um, high def. I wonder, does that work? That must work, right? You guys can see that. Um, I want people to be able to see details, especially if I'm, if I'm sending this off to a print on demand shop. Um, it needs to be super high quality. So 300 by 300 or 300 pixels per square inch, three, 300 DPI is the standard for printing. Sometimes I go a little bit higher on that because I use, um, you know, like watercolors can get really, really detailed on these. Um, I might use like 600 or 450 just to make sure that everything comes out really crisp and detailed uh, when it's printed out and when it's online. Um, yeah. And uploading them as JPEGs or PNGs for my purposes for the website work really well. Um, PNGs are, you know, obviously bigger files. And so knowing what your um, account is set to and how much storage you might have is something to, to consider if you're uploading a lot of pictures um, or if you're doing videos, when you're looking at like these different plans for a website, just keeping that in mind. So I'm actually not sure how, how much I've uploaded so far. I haven't really thought about it in a while. 
I should probably check on that. Um, okay, so then a couple of the other things that I wanted to touch was just the basics. Oh, so how do you post high-res images on your site? Are you worried people are just saving? I mean, people might do that. People still art all the time. That's kind of a thing that happens, unfortunately. Um, you know, what's cool about places like DeviantArt or ArtStation is that they can put um, a watermark on the art that you upload immediately, like just kind of automatically so that it's not possible for people to just kind of drag and save it off onto the side. Um, but otherwise, you know, you could just kind of lower the resolution on the images that you post online if you're worried about people stealing it, which is again, a possibility. Um, for me, I'm, I'm not particularly worried about that right now for the art that I do have up there. Uh, mostly because I'm going for visibility and just getting stuff up and getting stuff out. Um, I think sometimes, especially when you're starting out, you got to kind of think like, what is my immediate goal and how do I meet that? And then kind of move forward after that point. Cool. Um, I wanted to talk about picking a domain name and um, making sure that it's it's one that works for you. So um, pretty much all of the websites <laughs> that I showed you today other than mine, mine is the only exception. All of the websites have the artist name on them, which is a really good idea. Um, so you've got Carrie Tasman or tasmanstudio.com. You've got Lance McCarty.com, Alexander Schaefer's.com, Jennifer Lomers.com. All of those are fabulous um, website, you know, domain names because then someone can just kind of go on Google, be like, oh, what was that artist name? Oh, yeah, Alexander Schaefer's. I'm going to type in her name into Google. And her website comes up, which is basically how I found her website to include it in today's presentation. Um, I did not do that when I chose mine because I foolishly thought, well, Jen Hernandez, that's probably someone already probably has that. Um, and I thought that Inklings Illustrated sounded cute. Um, that is something that I kind of regret now, but I've decided to sort of stick with that brand for the purposes of continuity. Oh, thank you. Um, and, and I like it too. The way that I've sort of managed around that is that I also own jenhernandezart.com. Um, and I have that automatically going to Inklings Illustrated. So if someone were to be like, oh, Jen Hernandez, I like her artwork. What if I look her up and they type in jenhernandezart.com? It will pop up Inklings Illustrated. So it just redirects. Um, the con to that is that I'm paying for two domain names every year. Um, but the pro is that I can also own my email address, jen at jenhernandezart.com. Um, so it's kind of like I'm paying for a little bit of my foolishness in the beginning, but I get to own the two domain names. Um, when choosing a domain name, there's a couple ways to do that. I used Google domains. Um, I tend to be a little bit pushy about Google. Um, I really, I enjoy using Google. I've used it for you know, 10, 12 years. Um, so I'm really familiar with it. I don't necessarily think that everyone has to use it, but it's just something that I'm comfortable with. And so when it comes to exploring and trying different things, Google feels like a safe option for me. Um, there's also things like, you know, GoDaddy to find domains. They all work the same way where you would um, kind of search for a domain name if we're on Google. You would search for, um, you know, whatever we're looking to, to get as a domain name and see, it'll say whether it's available or not. And this one's not gonna be available because like I said, it's one of the ones I own. Oh, what a time for Google to be slow. Um, so, you know, it's like, it's not available because you already own it, Jen. Um, one of the rules of thumb that I think is really important is to try to stick with that .com as much as possible. Um, and that's a little, I think that, you know, that can, people can disagree with that for sure. Um, and I'm open to the discussion. I really like .com because it's what people expect when they are going to something that is professional and has been thought through. Um, it just gives it that like official feeling. Um, but, you know, Jen Hernandez art .org or .net are available. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're really tied to a name and you're not finding it as a .com, you could go with one of those other things, but you know what that means is that that already exists as a .com. And so, you, you know, you might be confusing someone if they try to go to your website and they end up somewhere else entirely. 
and you can't really control what that other website looks like. Um, so if you can get your name, .com. And if you can't, or if it's absorbently expensive, which it might be, because that's a thing with uh, domain names, then you know, tagging art on there or studio, um, you know, or coming up with a cutesy name like Inklings Illustrated, those are all things that you can do as well. Um, so what I would say is look for a domain when you're setting up your website. Use you know Google Domains or GoDaddy. They all use the same registry to see who owns what. Like that's public knowledge. So it'll be accurate no matter where you go. Um, I like using Google again because it's familiar, but also because it integrates with my Google uh, suite so that I can have my email address attached to a domain that I own. And it was like lickety split, this, like the simplest, quickest way to set up um, an email address and a domain name. Um, and I you know, use Google all the time. So I was really familiar with like the suite and Google Docs and sending things and making presentations, things like that. Um, one thing to think about though, um, which I experienced when I set up my website was not doing enough research, I think, before I chose Wix. Because once I had attached my website name to Wix, then um, I think there's like a 60 day you know, limit on how many times you can change what your domain is attached to. So at some point early on, I thought, oh, maybe I want to do Squarespace instead, and then realized that I had already attached my domain name to my Wix website and couldn't just like move it to Squarespace. So I would say choose your domain name and then choose your platform and then sort of settle into, OK, what am I going to be using um, officially from now on? OK. What are my feelings? Oh, Namecheap is great, too. Oh, for a domain. That's awesome. Thank you for that tip. I haven't tried that. Uh, feelings on watermarks. I think that they're handy um, to protect that art so that people can't just rip your art and put it up on their desktop. But people will. You know that, That's a thing that's going to happen, especially if they're really attracted to it. Um, I sign all of my art, even if it's just like a sketch um, and it goes up on my Instagram. I just sign everything immediately. It's a little bit harder to remove a signature than it is a, as um, a watermark. Um, if someone's you know good at Photoshop, they can definitely go in and take the watermark off and um, you know make it their own, whatever they want, really. <laughs> and you know it would it would be just like an extra step for me to add a watermark um, when sometimes I'm just like I just want to get it up there and make sure make sure it's out. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go back to my notes here and do a little review, make sure that we have covered all the things that I wanted to cover. Oh, that was on the, sorry, shouldn't have closed that. That was the right one to be on. <laughs> Wasn't it? No. Which one am I sharing? Okay, we're going to see a little back end for my getting back into my Google here. I really enjoyed putting my website together. Um, it's just been like another way to kind of explore what I feel like, what I want my art to feel like. Because um, the website is just an extension of my art into the internet. Um, and my art is kind of just an extension of myself into the universe. Um, so, so kind of putting it together and really crafting like what that feels like and, and how people interact with it has been just a kind of a fun way to explore my, my purposes and what I like to do with my art. Okay, so we talked about portfolio and the contact page and we did a little bit about the about um, if you have an artist web or an artist statement, that's a great place for that to go. Um, if people are looking at your art and they're thinking about, you know, reaching out to you, maybe they want to host your art in a show or, you know, reach out for commissions. They might want to know a little bit about your materials, your inspiration, you know, what your purposes are with your art, and that will be a good place for that to be. Uh, that was the stuff about the portfolio contact page, about page, and the rest. And then design-wise, uh, making sure that you're 
website is clear, easy to read. Um, I really like to use locked headers um, as much as possible, just because if someone's scrolling through and they're like seeing some of my art and they're like, oh, I wonder if she teaches a class on how to do these paintings, then they can still always navigate pretty easily back to any part of the website that they might be interested in. Um, that's just a personal aesthetic for me. Austin Cleon. Instead of having, well, he does have a, a locked header. He also has stuff going on the sides here uh, where you can kind of see more about the things that he's already made and then follow him. You know, his contact information, his social media, all sorts of things. His website is probably the busiest I would go with the website. Um, it's got a lot of things going on. Um, okay. Oh. One aesthetic choice that I find to be really important is no matter where anyone is on your website, they should always be able to get back to your front page, which is your portfolio, your splash page. So if I was on Austin's page, looking around, thinking about his, his speaking, I might wanna go back and just kind of navigate back to his front page. So having that as an option is, is a personal preference and I just think really good um, website hygiene so that it just feels controllable um, and navigable for the user. Logistics, we kind of went over getting a domain as simple as going to Google domains or GoDaddy or what was it? Uh, was it Namecheap? What was that called? Namecheap. Um, choosing a platform, you know, what works for you? Are you gonna try to host a Shopify on your website? Then maybe Weebly, Squarespace are really good options for that. Weebly I think has the most affordable um, selling options. Um, yeah, I have some pricing here. So if you wanted to sell, I think all of these options, including the free option, you can sell on Weebly e-commerce. Yeah, you can have a shopping cart. Um, but you can't accept payments through PayPal. Yeah, you can do quite a lot actually with the free with the free Weebly, um, but you won't be able to have your custom domain. So maybe for $6 a month, it's worth it for you to have your artistname.com um, on your shop. Jen, can you talk a little bit about search engine optimization? Yeah, that's on here. Um, so search engine optimization is uh, making sure that people can navigate to your site just by searching through for hot words um, on mine and making sure that also everything is accessible. On Wix, um, it, they make it pretty simple to make sure that you have all your SEO to tools um, kind of set up. Um, so you can make sure that you're listed on Google when people search your name, getting those like ads that are pushed up to the top if you've ever searched for something and you're like, I know exactly what I'm looking for. I just don't want to type in the address and you search for it and it goes all the way to the top um, of your search results. That's how that's done on my site on, on Wix here. Um, there's also, you know, things like you can do ads, pretty simple just from the, um, the desktop here or the dashboard. Um, and then making sure that, you know, all those SEO tools are kind of worked into, oh my gosh. So um, a lot of these platforms are gonna have those tools available for you. I'm looking for the ones that I kind of put together. But maybe it was on the actual site edit here. <laughs> okay. What I end up doing quite a bit, now it's wigging out, here we go. Um, when I'm creating a post online uh, on my blog, oh yeah, let's go to the blog. That's going to be the simplest way to show some of these things here. I'm going to take a minute here. So my, um, my 
typical thing that I'm doing on the website other than putting art on is creating a little blog post about the art. Um, this is a great way to create just built in search engine optimization because there's so many, you know, I can put a hashtag in there. I can put art on there. And there's also a little SEO um, tag over here where I can decide what do I want the post uh, title to be? How do I want the search engine to find it? Um, descriptions where I can put more of those, like if I want people who are looking for a 100 day project um, blog post, they can find it by searching that. And then, you know, my website will come up on that. Um, and it kind of gives you this like little preview here. Um, using categories and tags, those are also ways to make sure that you're optimized. Um, and then following some of the steps on the platform that you use. If it's Wix, then it's all there on that. Oops, that's the wrong thing. Um, on the side with marketing and SEO. Did you have a specific question about that? All right. Um, no, I just was hoping to go over that a little bit. Um, let's see, there is a question. What is the approximate cost of your website per year, including domain name and email address? Um, so for the two domains that I own, um, they are $12 a year, both. Um, like for each of them. So $24 to have two domain names for no reason at all other than because I like one of them a lot. Um, to have my Google suite um, with my email address and you know all of the tools that I would get um, through Google, that's $6 a month for one user. If you're gonna have more than one user on your account, then it's $6 I think per person. Um, yeah, so. Was that end up being six times 12 is uh, 72. So 72 plus 24. So we're looking about $100 for me to have two domain names and a website. Um, yeah. And my blog is with, with Wix. Um, it's all on the same, it's all on the same one single platform. Did we want to go to questions? Yeah, let's go to questions. Kind of at that time. Ooh. Does anybody else have questions? I, I don't know if I'm getting everything. It seems like I have kind of gotten a little choppy on my end. So Jen, if you see something, please jump in. Yeah. Give people a moment to uh, type up their questions. WordPress blog with the Wix website. You might be able, you know, hmm. I wonder if, if you're asking Jesse if you would be updating the WordPress blog and it would automatically update to Wix. Um, I'm not sure that, you know what? I think there is a way to do that. If you were to add a blog through, let me share this here. Let's kind of go through it together a little bit while we explore and discover. I want to see my thing. Here we go. Um, if I were to add a blog on Wix, I can add custom feed. We'll just add it to my website and see what happens. So that is my Wix blog coming up here. It's the same thing that you would see. Um, if you were to go to the blog part of my website, hmm. I feel like there should be an RSS. Maybe I missed that. Oh, here we go. So you can, people can um, subscribe through an RSS button. But can they, can you import from a different website? Hmm. 
There's probably a way to do that through if accessing your um, WordPress blog and the HTML from that to embed it on another website. And then you would need to go in and add that um, manually to uh, your, your Wix website. Uh, what I ended up doing, because I did have a WordPress blog um, and I wanted to um, have some of those blog posts here, is I pretty much copy and pasted and put them here. Um, one thing that kind of is important and is, is a, a pro for having your shop as well hosted through your website is that the longer you keep people on your website, um, the better you'll get, you know, interactions, you know, the longer people will be just seeing your work and engaging with you. Um, and it'll also create, um, you know, like a, a, a way for people, like you'll, you'll show up more in people's automatic searches and their autofills and, you know, suggestions. And if you're paying for ads, then you'll end up in their Facebook, all of that kind of, you know, back end um, connection sometimes that creeps people out, but it's really important for small businesses and proprietor, proprietary ships. Um, you know, that's how that will happen is if you keep people on your website and they're interacting with you a lot. Um, so what I did was I just took my blog posts that were on my WordPress and pasted them back into my, um, my new website, my Inklings Illustrated website. Um, and what I did just for the sake of transparency, get to one of those, it's been a while. Um, so I wrote a little bit about art programming and education. Um, I just kind of like put a hyperlink to the original um, website where my original blog post is because it's all the internet is forever. Um, so this is still out there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a bit much to do that if you have a long running website or long running blog. Um, I'm pretty sure I haven't tried it myself, but it shouldn't be too, too complicated, I think, to get the an embedded, um, you know, HTML box from your WordPress onto your Wix website, if that's really what you wanted to do. another one here my wix account is not free my wix account is um oh my wix account is i think the 11 dollar a month version or no it's the 20 dollar a month version um so i forgot to add that into the equation as well so if it's 11 dollars, that's so it's about 150 dollars for me to do all of the things that i'm doing um with my with my Wix and my um, email address and my domain names, things like that. Thank you for that reminder. I didn't really think about that, Sharon. Okay. Happy to answer any other questions we might have here. Uh, I want to put this up for us to see. I don't know if I got to all of these folks. Um, they are all awesome artists, many of them local. Uh, you should check them out. All right. Yeah. If there aren't any other questions, I think we'll wrap up. Um, thank you, Jen. Thank you. We really appreciate this. Um, this presentation, let's see. Let me X out of a couple of things real quick. That way I can focus. Um, this presentation will be recorded and posted on um, probably our YouTube and website as well as Jen's website. I think you're going to make available the PowerPoint mm -hmm. you're hearing. Um, so I guess that answers the very last question from Jay. She will share it on her website. Yep. Um, I think that's about it. Just Make sure to check out upcoming events and things like that on both uh, Jen's website and the Art Centers. Yeah, thank you so much, Claire and the Art Center. Yeah. All right, thank you everyone. <laughs> Thanks.